Good morning, Wednesday Bible Study. Hope you're doing fantastic today. Uh, welcome to our Q&A session as we wrap up through the, Bible through the Bible in a year, the study that we've been doing. Really, for more than a year, I guess we're at 18 months or yeah, a couple 20 years, months, something like that. Anyway, let's pray to begin. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you are, you are with us. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you that you have written in our hearts and our minds according to your covenant. Lord, we praise you because we know that you are working through your word to shape us to look like Jesus. Lord, help us, God, as we come to your word to be doers of your word who are honoring you by our behavior and by our actions. And Lord, help us that as we see you through the scripture, we would love you more and that we would be spurred on to action to do great things for your kingdom. Thank you. Lord. In Jesus' name we In pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, welcome to our Q&A session. We have several questions. The one big burning question that we've had uh, from Gloria Chenault and as well from Judy Radin has been from question number four from last week's Bible study of the Holy City from Revelation 21. Who is that? What is that? Where is it going? And so we're going to talk about that first. And then we have a few other questions that we've received that we're going to talk about as well. So here we go. Okay. The, the burning question from Revelation chapter 21. I'm going to read it. Verse 1. Then I saw John speaking. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. Uh, the new city, the heavenly city, the new Jerusalem, uh, when again, using the um, hermeneutic principle of scripture, interpreting scripture, we think to ourselves as we're reading along, what else have I read in the Bible where something comes down. Something comes down, okay? Well, the, the Son of God came from heaven uh, to be incarnate in human flesh, okay? The Holy Spirit came from heaven. Remember, there was a sound coming from heaven, coming from heaven. And here he comes from that location, heaven. Okay, that's the Holy Spirit. But then... In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, we have another explanation of something coming from heaven. And I think this answers the question as to the location of the holy city and what it is. Uh, this is typically known in dispensational circles as the rapture. But the interpretation of it is dicey. When you say rapture, meaning time periods and blah, blah. I'm going to explain it as briefly as I can. But what you have here is the finality of his, human history. What you have here in 1 Thessalonians is when the Lord comes finally, that is the end of the last enemy, death, which death will be no more. So when something comes, death is no more. So here it is. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others who do not have hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. So far they're in a location called heaven, but he's bringing them with them. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven, from heaven, with a cry of command, <clears throat> with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. This is resurrection day. Mm -hmm. This is Jesus coming to earth on resurrection day, and the dead who have already gone before us and are asleep, dead, will rise and inherit their f new spiritual bodies to be just like Christ. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds 
to meet the Lord in the air, so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. And so the tradition here is that when a king comes into a village, the whole village goes out in procession out on the main road to meet the king, to escort him into the village. That's the reference here in the ancient world that Paul's making reference to. And so the dead will rise. Jesus is coming back to, to, uh, to gain his complete dominion over a completely healed earth after the gospel, the Holy Spirit, and the church has done its work of destroying all of God's enemies. The holy city, which is primarily redeemed people. The holy city, because it's a bride, it's a person adorned for her husband, meaning that when we see him, we will be like him. We will be like the groom. We will be, have been made immortal. 1 Corinthians 15 says, uh, after death is conquered, then comes the end. And so the holy city, that is, those coming with Christ, and we're going to meet them in such jubilation, and we're all going to come and occupy a completely healed earth so that the city of God, which is already in its perfect state in heaven, will have fully enveloped the broken, fallen world after perhaps millennium of gospel activity in the Holy Spirit through the people of God, we will have arrived at a place where all of God's enemies are subdued by the power of the Holy Spirit through God's people, except death, because only one human has beat death, and he has to come to finish the job. He's the Alpha and the Omega. And so when he comes, uh, the holy city description there is all the redeemed people, ready, filling the earth with the Lord's glory coming through us. When we see him, we will be like him. So that's a short explanation. There isn't time periods of chop up. There's just one major event, the coming of the Lord and the resurrection of the dead, for which that is our Christian hope. Mm -hmm. When someone dies as a Christian, you say, oh, it's so nice he's in heaven, this is great. No, that's a temporary stop. The hope of the Christian is we have been crucified him, we've been buried with him, we've been raised into newness of life, and our bodies shall be raised on that day to achieve immortality like the Lord. And so you're not complete until your body joins your disembodied soul, and now you're one complete person, um, dwelling on the earth forever with the Lord, God. And so, in essence, the whole earth becomes the Lord's temple because the Lord, the definition of the temple in the city, it's all congruent mm -hmm. there, is the temple is where God is. And so the whole world becomes the Lord's temple because now he can walk about in paradise restored. And so that's the exhilarating es eschatological point that both book of Revelation and Paul's making in Thessalonians here. So that's your answer. Mm -hmm. Good. <laughs> yeah. Um, notice, too, that the trajectory of the, of the coming is down. So the trajectory is not going up. Yes, caught up in the clouds with him. So yes, temporarily. Yeah. But the trajectory overall We're is going the Lord to the coming, the Lord coming down. That's true both in Revelation 21 as well as 1 Thessalonians 4. Yep. And so the idea of just disappearing, going away, is not what this is referencing. What's referencing is not in the Bible. caught up with him as he's descending, as he's coming, which is the same thing that Revelation 21 is talking about. Uh, notice, too, as we have talked in the past before about the temple references. So this is the new heaven and the new earth. The old heaven and the old earth has, gone, has passed away. And it's interesting in Revelation 21, verse 1, that the sea is no more. Because these are temple language references, as we've talked about in the Bible study in the past. Yeah. So those things have gone away, and the new holy city, Jerusalem, has come. It's God's people. But all of this language is, the temple, of course, in Jerusalem, is the descending of God's presence again bodily in the second coming, or the, the final coming of the Lord, mm -hmm. uh, to bodily be with his people in which the temple is complete, if you will, mm -hmm. completely. So we're already there. 
We are already temples of the Holy Spirit where God has indwelled us. His glory is in us. We've become his glory manifest on earth, if you will. But there will come a day in new bodies when he is also physically with us. And, and that's what Revelation forever. That's what Revelation 21 and 1 Thessalonians 4 is talking about. And this is at Jesus' return. There'll be more on this in the Sunday sermon that's coming up here on May 10th. Yeah. So, which is happy Mother's Day to all the moms out there. Uh, but we're going to be talking about the parousia, the final coming of Jesus. The final appearing of the Lord. And so, so tune into that because that'll be our Sunday morning sermon. That'll have even more on this since we're already 10 minutes into yeah. our... Very good. One question. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it says the sea will be no more. There's actually two meanings there. The, the basins, the huge basins, which were undergirded by carved bulls in Solomon's, just magnificent. When you looked on it, there were 10 of them. And they held, I can't remember, something like 30,000 gallons of water apiece. They were immense. And so they were nicknamed the sea. That was the sea in the temple, S-E-A. And with the sea being no more is there's no more physical temple because we're the temple and now the whole earth is going to be the temple of the Lord. So you can't keep God in a box anymore. He's going to own and manage the entire world with the saints. How exciting. Mm. How totally, exhilarating. Totally purified. But, the also, are, are, but also I might mention that the sea in Scripture <laughs> is always a reference to chaos. The stormy sea, the choppy sea, the raging sea. Um, the Lord is Lord of the flood. He's the Lord over chaos. Mm. And so chaos won't be no more as equally. There'll be no more so every tear is wiped away because there's nothing to cry about anymore. There's no more pain. There's no more sorrow. All chaos is removed from paradise restored. Oh, man. Makes you, makes you dizzy. Makes you feel like you're going to be raptured. Not really. All right. Go ahead. <laughs> Moving on. Okay. Next question. What can Christians learn from the Old Testament? Is it, pertinent, is it as pertinent to my growth as the New Testament is? And how do we apply uh, the Old Testament to Christian life today? Okay, the, this question being asked, it's okay to ask this question. I understand the, uh, the challenge that's out there. 80% of the world is dispensational in, in theological thought. Uh, we're coming from a covenant theology perspective, which is different. And in, in dispensational thought, it's all choppy. And you will hear dispensational teachers say, you don't need the Old Testament. You just live, you live in the new, you visit the old a little bit, and you know, you get some stories or what have you, but you're a new covenant Christian. All you need is the New Testament. Well, that, there's a little folly in that. That's like asking, do I really need a foundation in my house? Is the foundation of my house really important? Well, we live in Tornado Alley here in St. Louis, Missouri, and we can answer emphatically, yes, the foundation is important. Whenever a tornado comes through our community, the first victims are always trailer parks. They're tossed around like little beanbags in the sky because of the wind, you know, 88, 90 plus miles an hour, break them up like little sticks. Because there's, there's no foundation that's holding them when they're battered by the storm. And so the, the Old Testament acts like a foundation to the New Testament. It's not something you can dispose of. Uh, the New Testament, when it's boiled down, it only covers about five years of redemptive history that are salient. Uh, the Old Testament covers 2,000 years of redemptive history. Uh, it's two-thirds of the whole book of the Bible. One-third is the New Testament. And so it's, it's, it's pretty odd to think, well, we'll just brush two-thirds away and start living from Matthew 1.1 1, 1 forward. Um, the apostles understood who Jesus was solely from the Old Testament scriptures. They explained in detail who the Christ was and what his work meant from the Old Testament. It was Augustine who, who coined this phrase, the old is in the new revealed. The new is in the old concealed. So it comes about as one story, one narrative, one book by which we live and, and God reveals himself 
through the one book and the one story. Um, I already mentioned three-fourths of the, oh, about three-fourths of the information in the New Testament is either a quotation of, an allusion to, or a fulfillment of something that was already found in the Old Testament. It's impossible to know God's holiness without knowing the book of Leviticus. Well, I won't read Leviticus. It's just too boring. Yeah, <laughs> you see, by not reading it and studying it, you lose the emphasis of Leviticus to teach us how holy God is. It's not boring. It's eye-opening. And it causes us to be serious about sin and serious. Maybe the world is so lackadaisical about these things because they have just brushed off things like the book of Leviticus. It's impossible to understand the book of Revelation without knowing the book of Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Isaiah, and Daniel. So we are dependent on the Old Testament to inform us of our revelation of God and then seeing that fulfillment picture in the New Testament. So. Yeah. If you take the Old Testament out of the Bible, generally speaking, you get a New Testament that is uh, empty of its co full content. So Jesus is, is, is quoting the Old Testament all the time. Uh, Jesus' own understanding from, say, a moral perspective is the Old Testament understanding of how life works. Mm. And so if you take out that context, then you get a gospel that's devoid of the real character of God. And instead, you're left with um, fancy ideas that then get interpreted by people in human wisdom yeah so for instance that's how you get to well jesus is just a great teacher and he taught love and he's really nice and he is a great teacher and he did teach love but that love had a context so for instance when he's talking about marriage his understanding of marriage goes all the way back to genesis when god first created man and woman and he says what god has joined together let not man separate mm. and so his understanding about real life regular things is not just, oh, love is the answer. Mm -hmm. It's love is the answer in the context of who the character of God is. Mm -hmm. And so as Christians, we are in danger of losing the very character of our Savior if we cut out the Old Testament and try to only understand him through the New Testament. Yes. Uh, it's, he is the Word. Mm -hmm. So you can't take who God is out of the word, and you are in danger of doing that if you try to do that. And make up what you think God should be like just using the New Testament. That's exactly what it uh, is. This is a common heresy that's come over church history um, that Augustine fought tooth and nail equally is basically the thinking, I don't like the God of the Old Testament. I like the New Testament God. He's great. He's so kind, and he helps widows, and he's nice. The Old Testament God is rough and terror and judgments. Don't like him. Here's the problem, Trinitarian. Same God. Same God. <laughs> it says Jesus filled out the revelation of who God is. He fulfilled it. Mm -hmm. Behold the kindness and the severity of God. You can't separate or confuse the, the essence of the Godhead. Like Stephen said, you need the whole Bible, which is the whole revelation of God, for us to know how to relate to him, how to worship him, and how to serve him. Yeah. All right. Um, here's, a great, here's a great question to ask yourself or your friends to find out if the Old Testament is important. Is why did Jesus die for us? Yeah. Why did Jesus die? Uh, I, when I was in seminary, I got to watch a video of some missionaries who were in Fiji or someplace like that. And they were speaking to a native culture that was there who had never heard the gospel. And so they were talking to them and explaining to them about Jesus, and they kind of didn't get anywhere. And so they decided to do drama presentations. And they started in Genesis doing drama presentations about things. And they got to Leviticus, and they were trying to do drama presentations to help the, the tribe understand about, uh, the, about Leviticus. And they thought, how do we do this? So they started going through, and as soon as the tribe's people understood about sacrifice— Suddenly there was a mass of people who came forward uh, claiming Jesus, repenting of their sins, because without understanding sacrifice and the sacrificial system, they didn't understand why Jesus had died for them or what the missionaries were talking about when they say, Jesus loved you, he died for you. It, was, it had no context to it. Mm -hmm. But in understanding the sacrificial system, all of a sudden they realized that Jesus was not just the one who died for us. He was the blood sacrifice 
that enables us to come before God and make us righteous. It's his righteousness upheld and not our own. Thanks. And so instead of trying to work up their own righteousness, they fell on their faces before God, begging to be saved by the Lord. That we've lost in our culture. Yep. And we've lost that in our culture because people don't fear God because they don't know the Old Testament. And they think that Noah is just a fancy story and it's a myth. Uh, they think that all the judgment things are icky and bad and we don't want to know about those things. They think that it's just a fake history made up by Israel. It's not. It's the testimony of who God is and who he is and why Jesus even had to come and save us. Yes. Why did he become a man? If we can't answer those foundational theological questions or if they don't matter to us, then we need to reevaluate how we are serving God because you may not be serving the God of the Bible. Correct. Actually, which is shocking. We must always keep in mind the Bible is the revelation of God to us primarily. Mm -hmm. That you're reading and God is revealing himself to you through the reading of Scripture. From Genesis 1-1 to the end of Revelation, we are reading to know whom this God is and how we should serve him and how we should love him and how we should conduct our lives. That's the essence of the Bible. Amen. Okay, next question. Next question. Uh, what should Christians think of evolution? Is evolution at, odd with, at odds with Bible teaching? We, since, eight, since the middle of the 19th century, we have been in a constant war with this concept of evolution. Um, it is a slick presentation of the origins of life without God. And all human philosophy is an attempt to explain life, to make sense of life, to order life, and keep God out of the picture. That's most human philosophy is that way. Um, we suffer from blends, where we take a little bit of world philosophy and we put it with the Bible, and really those two things are not compatible. Uh, the, philosophy, the biblical philosophy, the biblical worldview is somewhat perpendicular to the world's fallen worldview. And uh, so evolution has completely taken over the planet. Um, there's no place you can go on earth where they don't assume that this is actually the truth now, that we evolved from primordial slime. Um, so what should Christian think? It should be rejected as a humanistic philosophy that rejects God, the creator, or limits him. Um, why I put or limits him is because there is a blend called theistic evolution, which is, to me, is equally as disturbing because it says, okay, we'll, we'll say God created, that's fine, but he used the means of evolution, millions of years, uh, to bring about things. And so you rob God of creating by divine fiat, which is ex an exclusive attribute of his, to create something out of nothing. Uh, and so I, I get nervous with theistic evolution. A lot of these people love Jesus, and so you have to tread carefully because they are brothers. They love the Lord. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm just saying I feel that anything connected to evolution or wholesale evolution needs to be rejected full. Uh, by Bible-believing Christians, because the issue at stake here is not just the argument about how did life begin. It's the age-old problem of, of has God said? Mm -hmm. Are we going to believe the authority of the scriptures? Or we, are we going to believe, and I'm not going to use the word science, because that creates a straw man. It's not science. That's true. Science That's is theory. being able to have a lab experiment that you can do over and over and over and over to prove its validity. That's science. None of us were there when the world was created. It's a philosophy. Yeah. It's, it's a theory that you cannot prove. It's impossible to prove because you take a creationist, he looks at a fossil and he says, oh yeah, uh, the flood happened, worldwide flood. And he makes his conclusions that way and God created the world and there we go. You take someone who's involved in science who doesn't want God in his mind at all. He looks at the fossil. He said, oh, it's billions of years old, and it's this and that. And then two completely different uh, conclusions by the same evidence. The problem is um, we have the word of God, and you've got to decide. This is what God said how he 
created. He didn't say, oh, you experiment some more and you add to this story a little bit, whatever you feel comfortable with. He just said, this is how I created. And so we're faced with, as Christians, we're going to have to believe that or not. Mm -hmm. And even if we look foolish to the so-called worldly wisdom, so be it. Uh, the question is, is man in his origin the product of a purposeful act of divine intelligence or is man a cosmic accident? Um, a Christian cannot believe that he is a cosmic accident and at the same time believe in the sovereign creator God of the Bible. They, they do not meet. If there is no creation, there's nothing to redeem. So the story of redemption falls apart. If we only evolve from a primordial slime, then whatever God, if what God created doesn't need to be redeemed. It just needs more science and more time and more evolution to uh, achieve some kind of perfection. This is a fascinating subject to me. I've always been curious about people who believe in UFOs and aliens and these kind of things. Did you ever notice that whenever you see a movie or a story about aliens coming to Earth, they're always super intelligent? They're not ever hillbillies or I have a third grade education and just don't know what they're doing. They're always so superior. And you can see by their egg heads that they're portrayed as super brilliant. That comes from evolution, that this is where we're headed. And some worlds have already achieved that. That's a lie. Those are demonic deceptions of the highest order. Mm -hmm. And yet so many people buy into this lie that it's terrifying. And the reason why murder and abortion and all the other things are on such a high level in our uh, modern world is because if you're only a cosmic accident, just do away with it. Just kill it. Have a video game and have 5,000 kills in one day. What's the big deal if it's only primordial slime? So there's a problem that man doesn't achieve what God wants him to achieve by knowing he's the creation and image bearer of God. Mm -hmm. um, so here's an important distinction too. The question is, what does what should Christians think of evolution? The question is not, can a Christian believe in evolution? And I'm making that distinction because there are, like my dad mentioned, theistic evolutionists and stuff, uh, people who love God, who are, who are seeking after him, who believe in evolution and and we extend fellowship to them and love them. Yes, of course. Um, we are not saying we are not saying that you must reject in all ways evolution to become to be a Christian. Having said that, having said that, evolution as a possible theory scientifically is different than the philosophies of life and the worldview that evolution creates. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, let me let me just use an illustration. Um, think about marriage for a moment. Marriage, biblically, is God's ordained way of procreation. It's God's ordained way of an intimate sexual relationship between a man and a woman in which they come together. And it demonstrates the kind of intimacy that God wants to have of his bride, the, uh, the church, and his son, Christ. So it's God's illustration, living illustration, of what a real relationship looks like as a Christian with God. Uh, and Paul says that's a great mystery. And because of that, we have a high regard for marriage. And because of that, we reject uh, divorce. Because of that, we protect <clears throat> marriages. Because of that, we have uh, marriage ceremonies that are really important. Because of that, we um, do not believe in illicit sexual relationships. All those kind of things. Now, from an evolutionistic philosophy, worldview standpoint... Marriage is just a way for you to get your genetic code into other people, basically. And so marriage really has more to do with your own fulfillment and feeling good and sexual fulfillment and less to do with covenant or obligation or duty. Those become social constructs, we call them. And so those social constructs are things to be questioned. And so things like divorce or uh, remarriage or even rape, you know, we, those things are awful. Everybody would say rape is wrong because it's a violent act against somebody. And yet, there's this funny worldview opening that getting your genetic code into other people and stuff is, is part of your primordial animalistic tendency. 
Um, now, of course, rape is wrong, but I'm saying that because when I counsel young people coming into a marriage, I always have to sit down with them and say, you are not animals who are trying to just have sexual relations with each other like animals. This, this is not your urge that needs to be fulfilled. Husbands, you love your wife, sacrifice for her, bless her, help her, and that sexual relationship looks like what God intends for a relationship to be biblically. Totally different worldview than just what Cosmopolitan Magazine says about make sure you get your sexual gratification. And those come from competing worldviews of evolution and the Bible. That's correct. That's really, really important. <clears throat> Very good. I think it's good. Excellent. Okay, next question. Next question. Uh, why does God allow random shootings, fatal accidents, and other <clears throat> bad things to occur? Okay, uh, age-old questions uh, since the beginning of time. Why is there evil in the world? I don't pretend that our answer here is going to be conclusive or uh, a, a, a trump to everything that you've ever heard. Not pretending. It's still a mystery. It still disturbs us. It's still very difficult to cope with uh, in our fallen world. Um, death and suffering entered into the world as a direct result of sin and rebellion against God. You can't bypass that fact. Whatever the world says, where was God in this situation? You have to understand that in their worldview, they don't have any room for human rebellion or sin. They think they're okay. They have suppressed the knowledge of God in them. And so God needs to be what I want him to be. He needs to cater to my needs. Why did my little ba baby girl die? What's wrong with him? He did that to me. But see, they, the creature is never the judge of the creator. That's not how it works. We're the creatures. And God's not playing fast and loose with us, but he has allowed sin and death to remain in our fallen world. Uh, now, we wish he would just wave a wand and it would be all right that way. Um, something far greater than a wand, this is where God is headed is to give us a world of complete shalom and peace and paradise restored, but not yet. Uh, the world is a place that is full of sorrows and tragedy. Uh, we're not Christian scientists who put our head in the sand and say mm -hmm. evil doesn't exist. No, it does. It, it's real, and it hurts, and it hurts everybody. The rain falls on the just and the unjust, but so does tragedy and sorrow and suffering falls on the just and the unjust. If there was no sin, the world wouldn't have shootings, accidents, mayhem, and war. It's that simple. The root of all of our human anxieties and problems and sufferings is sin. Mm -hmm. Death is not yet removed from the human experience. I want to read a little passage of Scripture and only take a moment from Luke chapter 13, where Jesus kind of addresses this very question. Luke chapter 13, verse 1 uh, there were some present at the very time who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answered them, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Are those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them? Do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Now, whoa, whoa, whoa. That's a pretty harsh response by Jesus. They're people's dead, suffering. What happened, Lord? Where was God in the Tower of Siloam? Those 18 people. Jesus doesn't address it head on. Instead, he uses this occasion to say, you think this is bad. If you don't repent of your sins, the eternal punishment is going to be so far worse. It's not comparable. And so God allows evil to continue in human existence as warnings, as forerunners of what we're headed for, ultimate destruction, if we don't repent. Because sin must be paid for. And if you don't take the gift of Jesus Christ mm -hmm. 
and allow his payment to be fully satisfy that debt, then you're going to have to pay for your sin. Sin has to be accounted for. Sin has, that's the justice of God. He, God cannot, he's not capable because he's a God of justice. He's not capable of saying, oh, well, you tried your best. It didn't work out. He can't do that. Just like it's not in his nature to lie, it's not in his nature to just scrub off crime, uh, especially against himself. It must be atoned for. It must be paid for. Mm -hmm. That's the justice, and justice and righteousness are the foundation of his throne. So the world is in rebellion against God. But when this happens, instead of saying, where is God?, Turn this to an opportunity to repent of your sins and say, whoa, I see where this is going. This is a small picture of what eternal destruction looks like. I don't want to head there, so forgive me, Lord, of my sins. I receive Jesus as the free gift, and I, I make him Lord of my life. You turn it as an opportunity for repentance rather than shaking your fist at God, and you now become his judge. So that's a little short version of why there continues to be evil in the world. But uh, every time these things occur, mm -hmm. um, the church people don't have any answer, and the, and the re rebels against God get away with basically blaspheming him and uh, trying to be his judge. And it's, a, it's time that the Christians stood up and gave these answers. Um, you should repent, because the, we have to understand that there's not a one-on-one -on -one correlation between judgment, sin and judgment. Oh, God judged, judged those 18. Jesus didn't say that. Same thing with the story of the man born blind. Mm -hmm. They were saying, uh, who sinned? His parents? No. Yeah. And Jesus said, don't make that one-on-one -on -one correlation. Yeah. There's evil in the world so that I can show you two pictures. How evil you are and where you're headed for in destruction if you don't change your rebellion. And second of all, to show you that I'm the God of transformation. So I'll heal, I'll, I'll save, I'll do this, uh, not every time, but sometimes, to give you two pictures. One is how corrupt the world is and you are and how there's a way of escape if you'll accept it, and how glorious and how pristine and how wonderful God is. Uh, he gives you two pictures. When he heals or delivers or does something in the positive direction there. Now, just because he doesn't do it all the time doesn't give us reason to sit in judgment against him as if we're the judge of God. True. All right. Good. Okay. Next question. Can you define the sovereignty of God? God's sovereignty. No. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Whenever you give a definition of God's sovereignty, it, it's almost like you, you don't have sufficient English words to say it clear. Mm -hmm. there, it, I, every time I've attempted to formulate something that, says, that gives a clear definition of the sovereignty of God, I've always felt like I left something out, I should have said more, um, so when this question is asked, uh, it, it reminds me of what W.C. Fields said one time, the comedian actor from well over a century ago, W.C. Fields comic. Uh, one time he was making a movie and they caught him in his trailer and he was reading the Bible. Now he was known for drinking and carousing. Here he is, he's reading his Bible. And uh, the stagehand who went to fetch him was so dumb, dumbfounded to see W.C. Fields reading the Bible. He says, may I ask you, Mr. Fields, what are you doing? And he says, I'm looking for loopholes. And so uh, that's the nature of human rebellion. We look for loopholes. What's the minute? What, can I get this past God? Can I do? No. The answer is no. The God who sees all and knows all, there's nothing you can slip past God. Uh, here we're making this broadcast for the United States of America, and we have immense problems when it comes to the sovereignty of God. I'll be candid with you. To teach this, uh, there's a natural American, United States of America, knee-jerk 
you know, pulling back whenever you talk about the sovereignty of God, because this country, uh, the slogans from the Revolutionary War, which got freedom from George III and from Great Britain's rule over us as colonies, here's, here's the slogans that were current in the Revolutionary War. Don't tread on me. You've seen the snake sign. Uh, you've seen those, I'm sure, in parades and what have you. Don't tread on me. Here's another one uh, that was just as common. Called, we do not serve sovereigns here. Hmm. So the, the, the drive to get away from, okay, unfair taxation, there's a litany of, well, read the Declaration of Independence. I'll show it for you. That was the complaint list of what was happening to the citizens in the colonies who were under the rule of the Britons, and they wanted to be, quotes, free. I'm not going to comment on all that. All I'm going to say is, because of the Revolutionary War, <laughs> United States Americans have an inbuilt allergy and reaction to the word sovereignty. Mm. Well, what about my freedoms? Mm. And uh, so that's usually why this question comes up. Uh, I'm going to use something, something from the late uh, Dr. R.C. Sproul, who... I think had some of the best explanations on some of these things. So I, I, I'm just going to say this comes from him. This is not original with me. But he asked this question, and I found this amazingly helpful. He asked this question, is God in control of every single molecule in the universe? Now, before you answer too hastily, that will reveal if you are uh, Islamic or you're Jewish or you are uh, even Arminian in your theology, or you're Calvinist, or Augustinian, whatever, the answer is going to betray you. Because a lot of people will answer this question in degrees. But there's a problem with answering in degrees. Because if there was one molecule running loose that is not under God's control in the universe... It can alter circumstances and events that will not make it possible for God's word to be fulfilled. Hmm. And so that one maverick molecule would mean God is not sovereign. And if God is not sovereign, if it doesn't belong to his deity, then he is not God. There is not a God. Because the, the very definition of God Deity belongs to his being. Uh, sovereignty, excuse me, belongs to his deity. It belongs to his being. God owns what he makes and rules what he owns. Um, again, that's I, I, I'm crediting Dr. Sproul for that definition. God owns what he makes and rules what he owns. And so whatever smoking gun of rebellion is left in you, you're going to have to repent of it, and you're going to have to purify your soul and ask God to help you through the Word of God and through the Spirit of God because that, that niggle of rebellion, that wanting to react against uh, a God who is in total control of the universe is very real, and it will only lead us to destruction. It looks like it would be freedom, but ultimate freedom is submitting to the sovereignty of God for the human being. That's how we were designed. We were designed to worship and to serve the Creator. And ultimate freedom is, like Paul said, being a prisoner of the Lord. Mm -hmm. Yeah, true. You know, it's interesting how uh, Christians, just the base definition of sovereignty is that God controls everything. That's, you know, what, what does sovereignty mean? It means he's in control, ruling of everything, period. Um, not a molecule out of place. It's interesting, though, how Christians tend to pick and choose when we want God's sovereignty to work. So I, I remember I had a guy one time who um, sinned, you know, really publicly and it was bad and all, and he tried to hide it for a long time. And he said, why would God let me do this? You know, why did God give me the opportunity to sin? I know he's not the author of sin. Why did he do that to me? And I said, I said, brother, he didn't, he didn't do that to you. You, you did that. And you begged him for the, for the freedom to be able to do it. And, you know, sometimes when God answers us and he 
allows us to do things or things to happen or whatever. And we don't know the answer, like we said in the last question, of tragic things that happen. We don't know. We don't understand uh, why God would allow some of those things to happen or things that take place. And yet we know all the time that he is with us, that he is really in charge and he's ruling and reigning. And we don't get to pick and choose and say, why did you do it this way? I don't agree with you. Mm -hmm. Or why did you make me do that? When that's, you can't char charge God with those things. In other words, God's character shows us that he is truth and life and, uh, and faithfulness all the time. And so if he allows us to, uh, if he allows us to be in a situation where we choose to sin, we cannot charge our sin against God who's faithful all the time and say, you led me into unfaithfulness. He's promised in his word, he would never tempt us beyond what we can bear. And so, you know, we don't get to pick and choose and say, you're sovereign when things are going great. And when I feel good and when I feel close to you and you're sovereign when I'm blessed and you're sovereign when my children are good and my marriage is good and my relationships are good and my job is good. And then uh, when the effects of sin happen, now you're not sovereign anymore. Yeah. Why did you do that to me? And yet we have a temptation in that rebellion moment to do that. And we need to check our hearts as well to say, Lord, you are sovereign all the time. And where I have failed, I have failed. And I'm, I'm trusting your sovereignty that what you've said over me will come to pass, that you have caused me to be cleansed in Christ. I'm a new creation in him. Because if he's not sovereign in the one molecule, then we can't trust that in the big things like our salvation, that he's going to be true. Yeah. Or resurrection from the dead. Well, if God is not in total control, how can I believe him when he says I'm going to raise from the dead with him? Yeah. You see, so sovereignty is himself it's what he is and um, any reaction to that is a showing of how much human rebellion still remains in us and we bristle mm -hmm. um, and so the holy spirit bringing sanctification to our lives is flushing that bristling out so that we not only uh, embrace god's sovereignty we love him for it. Yeah. We thank him for it. And it becomes a bedrock for our lives. Yeah. It's how the Lord can say, it's how Job can say, the Lord gives and takes away. Best blessed be the name of the Lord. Yes. He it's understood. Not, yeah. And, that, and he didn't say that with happiness at horrible things happening to him. He said that in the midst of mourning. But the bedrock of his life is trust in God. That's and it. so that's what, see, that's the difference is you can say, Lord, I trust your sovereignty even though I'm suffering because he himself suffered for us on the cross. Yes. And we're quick to sometimes forget that when things don't go our way. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. Next question. Is this uh, the last one? Last question. Uh, now that we have finished going through the whole Bible, what main emphasis should we get? That is, how should this study have shaped our thinking about the Bible? Uh, the quick answer, and I'm going to unfold it a little bit, is... The, the entire scriptures from Genesis to Revelation is about the man Christ Jesus, is about Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. He is revealed to us in all of the scriptures. Remember on the road to Emmaus, he was explaining who he was from the scriptures. And it says their hearts burned within them mm -hmm. when they came to realize who Jesus was that he was God and that he had that God had come in human flesh and paid the penalty for our sin their hearts were burning but uh, the scriptures were explained the gospel was presented all through uh, the Old Testament whenever there was a sacrifice that was made whenever there was an altar that was made whenever there was a snake raised on a pole for the people to gaze it was a direct reference to yeah. Jesus Christ Damn. and the work of salvation that he was going to procure for us when he came in the flesh. And so the book is about Jesus Christ. You read the scriptures not to get formulas to have a happy life, but to know God and Jesus Christ whom he has sent, John 17. This is eternal life, mm -hmm. that you, they would know me and God, they would know you, God, and they would know me, the yeah. son whom you sent. Those are the directives of our life. Is the Bible is about God and his Messiah and the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. And so 
You read the Bible to know God. Period. You read the Bible to know God. Not just to get formulas for life, mm -hmm. but to know God. Mm -hmm. Okay, having said that, the concept is the Son of God is the, is the meaning of the Scriptures. Bottom line, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The themes that go with him that are inescapable as part of the character of God is the kingdom of God and the covenant of God. Those three concepts, the right. Son of God, the kingdom of God, and the covenant of God run like one of my professors called it, a golden cable through the Bible mm -hmm. in its entirety to hold the one narrative, the one story together of God and his creation and the broken world and the and the the and the sacrifice of Jesus and the resurrection of the dead, the ascension, Pentecost, um, the final appearing of the Lord, the work of the church in the meantime, all of it is held together by three concepts: the Son of God, mm -hmm. the Kingdom of God, mm -hmm. and the Covenant of God. Amen. You look for those three things and ask yourself this question when you're reading: Am I reading about God's covenant? Am I reading about God's kingdom? Or am I reading about the revelation of the Son of Man? And that will be, that when you read your Bible that way, uh, you will be fulfilled and God will reveal himself to you. And again, that's the essence of reading your Bible. That when you come to the scriptures with the help of the Holy Spirit, God is revealed to you. And when he reveals himself to you, uh, you know him and you love him and you serve him. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. I think most Christians spend their whole life coming to the Word of God where they are looking for that feeling like the men on the road to Emmaus, walking with Jesus, and they want the feeling of our hearts burning within us. I love that feeling. I know you do too. I know my dad does as well. Um, we, we want that. We want to feel the, the passion and the fire and the burning of the Lord. Um, we want to see that in the gifts exposed. We want to see that in doing something for God. We want to see that. And many times we feel uh, dry. You hear that kind of comments. Like, I'm just really dry right now. I'm in a really dry place. I feel uh, a little depressed or lackadaisical or whatever. And so I just need, I just need a, f a refreshing from the Lord. And so we come to the Bible looking for that, that fire in our hearts to start burning again. And we say, Lord, just, just light me up again. Show me something and make me feel better. And the problem is, is that we're coming to God looking for a feeling rather than looking for him. And the way that we find the fire in our hearts, just like the men in, on the road to Emmaus, is they realized the risen, living, ruling King Jesus standing there with them. And as we come to the word of God and we ask the Lord that he would reveal to us his son, his kingdom, and his covenant, we will find as we see him and are close to him and filled with him, our hearts are lit on fire. And then our lives start to fall into perspective as we're following him. And sometimes maybe it's an audible word from God and you know, you know, turn left here and go. Maybe that would be awesome. But most of the time it's just walking with Jesus and staying on the road with him, knowing he's with you, seeing him in the sun, in the kingdom and in the covenant and our hearts lit on fire and then doing something for God. So if you get one thing out of this Bible study, seek Jesus. Any final thoughts? Any final, anything you want to say to anybody? That's it. Seek Jesus. Praise the Lord. He is the answer. God bless you all. Thank you for listening. Uh, hopefully we've answered all the questions. If we missed you, I'm so sorry. Um, we are going to take a break the rest of the month of May. Uh, in June, we'll come back together. Uh, without Dr. Adelini, he's going to have a break for a little bit. <laughs> I'm sure he's excited for some rest from teaching uh, multiple sermons and multiple teachings every week. And so he's going to take a break over June and July. And we will meet, though, and we're going to talk about the Lord's kingdom some more. It's going to be great. I'll have resources for you. So be expectant for those in the days coming up. And then we'll reconvene. We'll take another break in August. We'll reconvene in September with Dr. Adelini to start a new study on Romans. So this June, July will just be just those two months. It'll be specific and kind of a breather for us uh, while we stay in a study, but we'll be able to knock that out with an independent thing and then we'll jump in again in Romans in September. Physically together Physically by the grace together. of God. Won't Praise that be Jesus. a joy? That'll be good. God bless you all. I hope you're well. Uh, let us pray for you right now. Father, we thank you that
everyone listening to this Bible study, Lord, we thank you that you have called them to yourself, that you are revealing yourself by your scriptures. Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would light their hearts on fire, Lord, that their hearts would burn within them as they see Jesus, Lord, as they know your kingdom, and Father, as they experience and practice your covenant. Thank you, Lord, that you are our great king and that you are ruling above all things. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name Jesus we pray, name. blessing on everyone. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a great the day. God bless you.